it says this, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Tell somebody your hope is sure. What you've been hoping for is sure to come to pass. Yeah. Hallelujah. Both sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil. I want to talk to you this morning about life within the veil. Amen. Life beyond the veil. You may be seated in the presence of our life-changing King, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I believe by the end of today, we will see something from the word differently. And you'll say, that was a word for me. Hallelujah. Life within the veil. Hallelujah. What the veil refers to is, in the Old Testament tabernacle, and temple, there were three sections of the temple, amen? Hallelujah, the temple which the Hebrew people would go to worship in at least once a year, there were three sections. There was the outer court, there was the inner court, and there was the Holy of Holies. There was the outer court, which is also called the Court of the Commons, which is where the general population gathered. Then there was the inner court, also called the Holy Place, which was where all of the priests would meet. But then there was the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy, it's called. And then within there was the Ark of the Covenants, which represented the presence of God and it was separated from, there was a separation between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. The Most Holy and the Holy Place were separated by a veil. And only the High Priest could go in once a year to make a sacrifice for all of the people starting with his own sin. Amen? He, sa he sacrificed for his own sin, and then he made a sacrifice for all the people when he went in. Jesus Christ is our high priest, and he made one sacrifice for all times that, that took care of all of the sin, past, present, and future. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go somewhere. I want you to go somewhere and then I'll continue where I was going to go, what I was going to say. Mark's Gospel chapter 16, correction 15, verse 37. That was Old Testament. We know the Old Testament is given to us as a type and a shadow, as a teacher. Amen? And the Old Testament history is to give me something that causes me to see Jesus Christ properly, amen, in the New Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, amen, hallelujah. And today what I want you to see is a revelation of a difference between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship, hallelujah. Between the Old Testament holy of holies, amen, and the New Testament revelation that I'm about to give you about living beyond the veil. It says this in Mark's gospel, chapter 15, verse 37, it says, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And something happened when Jesus made that sacrifice for you and me. It says, and the veil of the temple was rent in half from top to bottom. Living beyond the veil we see here, because of the ministry of Jesus Christ, there is no veil. 
There is no separation between holy and most holy. There is no separation between what the preachers, the prophets, the teachers can do and what you can experience as far as entering into the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The veil was ripped in half, it says, from top to bottom. That's something, that means something to me. It doesn't say the veil was rent in half from bottom to top. That would say that maybe it was something I had to do to make it happen, amen, to get the seam started, to get the rip going. But no, it says the veil was ripped in half from top to bottom. That means God ripped the veil that separated holy from most holy, amen. Therefore, there's no separation between you and me, hallelujah, between anybody. Nobody has any more preference or ability to receive the blessings of God than anybody else. The only separation is the separation between those who believe and don't believe. Amen? Amen. We can all enter into life within the veil. Life within the presence of God. Life beyond, hallelujah, the imaginary wall, hallelujah, that we put up that says, well, that's for the apostles. That's for the big name preachers. That's for the big name ministries. That's for the people who stand behind the pulpit. No, there's no separation between the people of God. There are no big eyes and little U's in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. No separation. Tell somebody no separation. no separation. Hallelujah. The veil has been ripped in half. There's no separation. Amen. Hallelujah. It says this in Exodus chapter 26, verse 33. Talking about Old Testament worship. It says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tax. That thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. But because Jesus ripped the veil, there's no separation between holy and more holy. Holy and most holy. Because Jesus Christ has made us all most holy. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're not graded by our holiness, our righteousness. Hallelujah. But Jesus Christ paid the price that made it so all of us have the same access to the Father. We can all live within, hallelujah, the presence of God. Amen. And therefore, we can all live in the power of God. We can all live in the promises of God. Amen. There's no separation in the body of Christ. Let's go somewhere else. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you, um, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, amen. Um, World's YouTube on the other day. He talked about pulling down, casting down every vain imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And see, we've got ramparts, walls built up that cause us to think that this is the limit of what I can receive. This is the limit of what I can do. That other stuff, that's for, you know, somebody else. That's for... The, we all, it's almost a superhero mentality. That was for Moses. That was for Abraham. That was for Aaron. That was for those people. But I live on this side of the wall. No, there is no wall. The same thing God did for them, he will do for me. Mm. 
The Bible says this, and I thought it probably said it one time, that God is no respecter of persons. When I was looking up, this says it seven times. Seven times in the Bible, amen? I told you before, when I asked my oldest son, how many times do I have to say something before you say it's important? And he said twice. <laughs> well, God said this seven times. Seven times God says, I am no respecter of persons. There are no big I's and little U's in the body of Christ. There's no separation between the male, female, Jew, Gentile, bond, free. He says everybody in the body is somebody in the body. Hallelujah. And the same thing that I did for them, I'll do for you. The Bible says this also. It says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. How do I know that God will do what he said he'll do? Hallelujah. Because he did it then. And he is now who he was then. How do I know he'll do it? Because he will be who he is. He is who he was and he will be who he is. He does not change. Therefore, hallelujah, there is no separation between what God will do for me and what God will do for you. There's no separation between what God would do for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and what God will do for you. There's no separation. We can all live within what was confined behind a veil. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 and 16. It says, but their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Paul said, some people still read the book and see a separation. They still think of, that's a promise for them. That's a word for them. That applies to them. But they don't think that applies to me. That's a promise for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. They don't think that's a word for me. Moving beyond, hallelujah, just enough into more than enough. People read the book, but they don't see. That's a promise for me. Hallelujah. All the promises in the book, they're words for me. But some people still see an invisible barrier and wall that they don't see themselves on the other side. And they live this life separated from the promises of God because they don't believe they're worthy of the promises of God. Now, if we look at this physically, amen, look at this physically. There was a, what was there, the holy place or the most holy, holy, and the court of the commons. There was this area where the presence of God dwelt, the power of God dwelt, hallelujah. This presence, this part where there was the table of shoe bread, amen, where provision was provided. The golden laven, hallelujah, where my sins were washed. Then there was this area, the court of the commons. But if I don't see myself as living in the presence of God because the veil has been ripped if I make a separation where there is no separation then really where I see myself is in the court of the commons and I start to question everything that God has done for me if I can't see me 
differently, hallelujah, and see me as somebody who's worthy of the promises because Jesus Christ made me worthy, then I see myself living more like the world than, amen, I should be living if I'm living in the presence. Hmm. I got to see that the veil has been ripped in half. And there's no separation. No separation between what God says and how I should live. My life should look like the book. Amen? Amen. I want each and everybody look around. Look around the room. Span the whole room. Hold 365 degrees. And if you span the whole room, 365 degrees, you see everything in here. You see the pots, you see the speakers, you see the monitors, you see the cross, you see the pulpit, you see each other. But there's one thing in the room that you can't see, even when you look around 365 degrees. If I span the room 365 degrees, the one thing I can't see is me. I can't see me properly without the mirror of God's word. Amen. And the Bible says the word of God is a mirror. Amen. As looking into the mirror, it says, with open face, the veil being removed, I can see me differently and I'm changed by what I see when I look in the book from glory to glory. I'm supposed to be living in the glory of God. And I'm supposed to be looking like the book. Amen? Amen. That's if I take the veil off. Let's go somewhere else. In Exodus chapter 34, I may not have you turn here because it's a whole chapter pretty much, but in Exodus chapter 34, it talks about the fact that Moses went up into the mountain and he was in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. He was in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights receiving what we now know as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Receiving, hallelujah, the instructions from God. It was more than just ten commandments and two tablets that he got from God. Amen. He got the breakdown of how to build the tabernacle. He got the history, amen, of the beginning of the world. How else can Moses write, hallelujah, that in the beginning God created? Moses wasn't there. Amen. It's because he was in the presence of God and God showed him everything that he had already done, how he sold the fabric of space and how he struck the anvil of time, hallelujah, with the hammer of creation and caught the sparks in his hand and flung them and they become stars, hallelujah. How he spoke and the nothing had to produce something because they had no choice but to obey when God said, let there be light. God told Moses all that had happened even before we were here. He was in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says when he came down from being in God's presence, his face shined and his skin was new. And the Bible says he put a veil on his face so he could hide the presence of God, the fact that he'd been in the presence of God from the people. God didn't tell Moses to put a veil on. Because God is no respecter of persons. And because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same way that Moses spent time in the presence of God and his, the glory of God was evident on his life. Instead of putting a veil on to cover it, 
he should encourage other people to do the same thing. Because the veil gave the people an excuse not to pursue the same glory, not to pursue the same presence. Instead of following, seeking God, I'll just seek Moses. Instead of following the cloud of his glory, I'll just follow the crowd. Instead of seeing me living in the glory of God, basking in his presence, hearing his voice, hallelujah, experiencing his best and his blessings overtaking me, I'll just live like the common people do normally from little bit to little bit, from hand to mouth, from just getting by and just getting through when God wants so much more for you. Moses didn't understand that if he hadn't put a veil on, it would give other people the opportunity to know that the same way God did it for me, he'll do it for you. I read this poem, and part of the poem said this, our greatest fear is not that we are insignificant. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And we don't do anybody any favors by dumbing down our prayers, by diminishing our ability to go into God's presence, by belittling what happens when you live beyond the veil. Because when you get to the point that you Expect God to do in your life what he did in Moses' life, what he did in Aaron's life, what he did in Abraham's life, what he did in Isaac's life, what he did in Jacob's life, what he did in the lives of those who you have esteemed to be holier than you. When you get beyond the imaginary wall that we've kept up, even though Jesus Christ tore it down, you give other people the incentive and the right to pursue the same presence, the same power, the same provision that you do. But it happens only when we learn to live beyond the veil and learn to expect more from God than what we've been expecting. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's one thing that God expects from you. And it's the same thing that God wants for you. As a believer, what he expects from you and what he wants from you is more. What he expects from you and what he wants for you is better. And we should be ever living, pursuing the presence of God, the power of God, the promises of God, not putting up an imaginary barrier that makes it okay for me to stay in my present situation. But always pursuing the presence, the power, and the promises of God. Always living beyond the imaginary barriers that I put up in front of me. Casting down every 
high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, every thought of inferiority, every thought of my inability, every thought of insecurity, cast it down, it's an invisible barrier that needs to be removed. Every thought that says, well, people that look like me don't do this. Every thought that says people that come from where I come from, they don't have this. Every thought that says that my intellect, my intelligence, my education, my background, my history, my past says anything that separates you from entering into, hallelujah, the presence, the power, and the provision and promises of God, cast it down. It's an imaginary wall that only you have put up. God does not separate a holy from most holy because all of us have been made most holy by the most holy. Amen. That's why Jesus Christ doesn't have to come back and die every year. That's why Jesus Christ only had to make one sacrifice and it was enough to suffice to, hallelujah, break down every wall and tear every veil and remove every barrier and cast them down every high thought and cover every sin, hallelujah, and redeem every issue that we had, hallelujah. Jesus Christ has made it so we can enter into anything that God's word says he will do for me and you. And there is no barrier. There is no wall. There is no veil that separates us from the presence of God. There are no superheroes. You ever notice all the superheroes wear masks? It's so that we can separate them from us and say, well, that's somebody special. No, there's no veil. There's no mask. There's no barrier. Everybody has the same ability to enter into the presence, the power, and the promises of God. Because the veil was ripped in two. Not from bottom to top. Not because I did something that made me righteous. Not because I did something that made me holy, but from top to bottom, God says, I removed anything that separates you from me. God has removed the veil so that we can dwell in the Holy of Holies. We can live in the presence and the power and the provision and the protection and the promises of God. I meant to say this in a message, but just, I remember years ago when my wife and I were younger and I was prettier. <laughs> We would want a vehicle. You remember we wanted a vehicle? You had said before that that you liked this vehicle that your boss had. And we were thinking, but we can't, you know, that's above our income. That's above our pay grade. That's, you know, I don't see nobody that looks like me driving vehicles like that. And we were looking. We were looking at minivans. Can you see First Lady in a minivan? <laughs> we were looking at minivans and, you know, test driving them. And when the wind blows, you feel the wind shifting you back and forth. And, you know, just looking at these vehicles that we really didn't like. But, you know, we, didn't, we were thinking, you know, there's no way that the thing that we want, we can get. And my wife was at work. And, um, 
she had this office and folks would come in and pay their insurance and talk for about 30 minutes with her. You know? She's got that kind of personality. And it was this one brother, um, one brother, older brother, a uh, Caucasian gentleman. And we were talking about, you know, buying vehicles and we were looking at this and didn't like that. He said, well, why don't you just get, why don't you just get a Suburban? And I thought, why don't we just get it? Why did we put a seal in on what we could believe? Why did we think that that's above and that's too much and that's beyond what God will do for us? And so we bought the vehicle that my wife said she liked because the boss then came and said, you want to buy this vehicle? The thing that we said we liked and said it was too much, it was brought to us. What do you say? Oh, well, God will bring it to you. Amen. It was brought to us. I said, do you want to buy this vehicle? We, yeah, we do, as a matter of fact. And the very thing that we thought was too much and too big and too high and too far, and, you know, I don't see no black folks in trucks and suburbans, you know, but we, we said, that's what we want. And when we finally tore the veil, or should I say, we finally saw beyond the veil that had already been torn, and somebody asked, well, why don't you just get it? I don't even think he knew about the fact that we wanted a suburban, did he? But he just said, well, why don't you just get this? It wasn't until we received that revelation that we started to believe it's possible. The one thing I want you to take away from today's service is it's possible. Amen. All things are possible to them that believe all things are possible. That's living beyond the veil. Pastor Jerry and Shavella Gatson welcome you to attend worship services at the Ornament of Grace Christian Center, 121 Express Drive, Suite C, Lansing, Kansas. Join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. My Bible says, hallelujah, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. For more information, call 913-240-6262. The Ornament of Grace Christian Center, where God's grace is sufficient for you.